Well, <laughs> here I am about to do a TEDx presentation, which means I've committed myself <laughs> to the most feared situation as regarded by our modern civilization. I'm referring, of course, to speaking in public. <laughs> Believe me, every possible negative outcome is flashing through my brain right now. My insides feel like this. You laugh because you get it. Why do you get it? What on earth just happened here? I throw a couple of lines up on a piece of paper and you respond. They've become a magic bridge from inside of my head to inside of yours. You could explain it by saying, oh, we were taught to recognize those lines, you know, like letters. But that form of literacy, let's, let's go back when people weren't quite so literate. The 1400s. Leonardo da Vinci drew cartoons. He did caricatures called grotesques, and people got it then. We could go back to a port city in the first century. Dozens of different languages are spoken in the streets of Pompeii. And people would stand and look at the walls, and they recognized those lines, too. They got it. We could go back 20,000, 30,000 years to the caves of Lascaux, France, or Altamira, Spain. Look up the ceilings and see the scenes depicted there, the hunt. People got it then. You know, folks, Facebook is nothing new. We have been posting images for what could be 700,000 years if you look at some of the documentation from sites in India. I think that humans have been drawn to make their mark forever. And you responded to this. Why? Well, you could say artistic genius. <laughs> well, you could. If you did, I'd think you were channeling my grandmother. No, it's not, it's not talent or is it teaching that built that bridge. It has a lot to do with science. Now, the sciences, and I include math in that umbrella, the sciences give structure to everything we understand, including the arts. On the other hand, the arts give meaning to everything we understand, including the sciences, two sides of the same coin. I look at them as the bones and the flesh that comprise the body of knowledge we have created as people. And when those are joined together as partners, when they are fully integrated, that body leaps to its feet. It comes to life. It becomes animated. And a great way to show you how that works is through character design. Now, regardless of how an illustrator or an artist arrives at a character, I think most would agree that a very crucial area is the face. We humans are hardwired for faces. All of us have this sort of internal formula we use. It's a, a geometric equation that we apply whenever we see a face, and it's all based on survival, sometimes on ours or wondering what they do for theirs. Now, in science as in art, form follows function. So those forms we see, the geometric shapes, their sizes, and how they relate to each other, give us an idea what that animal eats. It's all based on nutrition. And although I hate the word diet because it starts with die, <laughs> in the end, a group of cells has to die for an animal to survive. So let me take you back to some of those caves I mentioned a few moments ago. Prehistoric times, that's where you live. And you are leaving your cave because you are hungry and you're looking for something to eat. Nearby, yeah. a twig snaps. You look up into the foliage and you see a pair of eyes watching you. These eyes are elliptically shaped. They are vertical in the way they sit from your position. 
and you watch for a moment and notice that they possibly have long, thick eyelashes. As the rest of a face emerges, you note that there is a mouth beneath those eyes and that it has full, flexible lips, strong lips, good for latching onto something like a plant. You're looking at an herbivore. Eyes are set far apart for peripheral vision. That's because they are problem seekers. They're always on the lookout for a problem about to come. If these lips curled back, you would notice that there are centrally located dominant teeth. Good for clomping on a plant and pulling it. The lips that latch, the, the teeth that pull. And you relax just a little bit. Herbivores can hurt you, but they are not there to eat you. On the other end of the stick, we've got another problem. You're in the cave and you're about to leave again, and you're hungry. You get ready, you notice there a, a twig snaps, and there in the foliage is a different set of eyes. These eyes are deep set. They're close together, facing forward. They're focused on you. Your heart just about stops. As a face emerges, you notice a triangular-shaped nose and very thin, stiff, narrow lips. You're looking at the face of a carnivore. You are in trouble. <coughs> If their whole face works, they'll peel those lips back to reveal canine teeth set distally apart. So here you've got a V shape, and here you've got a, an inverted V shape as far as the main parts of what these animals do to survive. And whenever we start thinking of human traits for an herbivore, a behavior, you might say it is an animal that is unknowing that an animal that is ignorant or innocent, such as, oh, your grandma's little lamb, or she froze like a deer in the headlights, or do not be a jackass again at tonight's party. <laughs> However, if you're looking at a carnivore and you give someone carnivorous traits, they usually have to do with a solution seeker, which is what I see carnivores as being. They've got a plan, whether it's in place or they've accomplished it, They've got one. So Richard the lion hearted, or don't try to weasel your way out of this one. So we use these animal traits as for human behaviors. And cartoonists know this. Whenever they're going to create a character, they try to manipulate how you'll respond by combining some of these. Disney has a movie out called Spirit. And in it, there's a horse who's very independent and very, very strong-willed. Disney gives the horse eyebrows and pulls the eyes closer together so that when the horse is angry or focused, the brows go down and the ellipses become more horizontal. On the other hand, think of Clifford the Big Red Dog. He has vertical ellipses for his eyes, and when he smiles, the gums look all nice and soft and floppy because he has no teeth. The worst he's going to do is bruise a banana. <laughs> but what about omnivores? What about us? Well, cartoonists get to go to town on the options there, but actually our facial features start out kind of herbivorous, and we live our whole lives and end up at the other end of that spectrum. So let me start with babies. Now, we humans have a very low bar for cutosity when it comes to baby mammals, including our own. I mean, after all, they're small, and they're warm, and they're cuddly, and they're completely vulnerable. How do you draw something like that? Well, once again, an artist uses math and science for these things. When babies are born, they're kind of half-baked. <laughs> and so their brain is only 25% of what it's going to be as an adult. However, ooh, here's the big difference. 
the eyes are 70% of adult size when a child is born. So they have to be placed really far apart since they take up so much room in that little skull. Not much is going on yet with cartilage or with bones, so they have little bitty button noses. And those lips, well, without any teeth to stretch them out, babies' mouths are full and flexible. They're nice and strong, after all. Think of the latching that they're going to need to do. And we just think they're darling. If you're going to draw a character that is infant or small, you use a one to four head ratio. If you're going to make one that little kids really like so that they identify with it being even younger or smaller, you might use a one to three head ratio. Paint them blue, call them Smurfs. <laughs> if you want to do something real disturbing with babies, you create a doll that's one to four heads high and then you give it teeth and call it Chucky. <laughs> that pulls my strings. I'm creeped out. I don't know about you. Now on the other end, things start to happen when you're going to create a character. And let's say you have one that grows on up, becomes an adolescent. During those years, our teeth form and they start in the center of our mouths. And then the jaw fills out and gets bigger. The brain keeps growing. You get longer arms, longer legs. Kids look a whole lot alike, though, during those formative years. But when hormones kick in, everything changes. Now, one universal, as far as creating a beautiful or attractive character, has to do with symmetry in either sex. Symmetrical features are always the most attractive. There are a lot of other nuances, though, that cartoonists might use that will enhance or detract from that as they build a character's face, again, based on the science. Young men will end up with lots more bone and cartilage, so their ears start looking bigger. Their noses seem to grow. And they get eyebrows which makes their eyes look deeper set. With the bigger noses, they look a little closer together. And of course, muscle is laid down. And I'm sure everybody's noticed the thing that they sport the first minute they can are those little bitty, crummy, beardy, mustachy things. <laughs> so we'll give this fella a little bit of each of those. And here you have a young man probably looking for Scooby-Doo, right? <laughs> so what is it that makes him procreational material is, again, it's easy with the symmetry. It's, it's the thing that lifts the character up and out of the shallow end of the gene pool and drops him into the hot tub. Well, if a young woman is not symmetrical enough, she turns to cosmetics. Gals like to do all sorts of extras coloring their hair, growing it out long. And then what is it that they push women to do with cosmetics? Oh, wait, it's get your lips to look full, flexible, strong, good for, oh, and, and then their eyes. <laughs> so we have a mouth that full, flexible, and strong, and the eyes, you want them big, wide, far apart, with a big, thick fringe of eyelashes to go with it, too. Oh, and here we have the hottie. <laughs> you know, it makes me wonder sometimes if the makeup is about beauty and symmetry, or if it might be about trying to be less threatening to the opposite sex. Time goes on if you're fortunate, I and mean, this may not sound so fortunate, because full maturity happens. The brain completes its journey, it's as big as it's going to get. You've had two sets of teeth come stretching that jaw, and a combination of genetics, life experiences, and gravity show up in a character. So gravity starts pulling all that cartilage down. 
ears look longer, and the nose looks a whole lot bigger. Eyes, they're at their full size, end up with heavy wrinkles, placing them deeper in a face as the tissue keeps getting softer and thinner and wrinkling. Eyebrows have gone a little bit wild, maybe. <laughs> and a character begins to have deeper lines in a face. These lines, I'll make this guy a little happier here, have a stolid philtrum there where the mouth is sealed at the center, a lip, and teeth tend to have receding gums so they look longer. This looks more like a muzzle in a face. And cartoonists use all of these lines at all times, every chance they get, in order to build a bridge from them to you. So the next time you happen to be watching cartoons and you laugh at Roadrunner, or you tear up when Harry Potter and Dobby say farewell, think about the science beneath the sketch and let the animation animate you. Thank you so much.